Romans chapter 8. Well, again, welcome everybody. If you're walking in late, my name is John Mark, and I'm another one of the leaders, and we're so happy you're here. It's been a wild ride since last Easter. A white supremacy rally in Charlottesville turns into a war. A car turns into a weapon, three dead, 33 wounded, and the soul of our nation cut open yet again. Just a few weeks later, Hurricane Harvey, 125 billion in damages to Houston and the surrounding area. Just a few weeks after that, Las Vegas, 59 dead, 851 wounded, the worst mass shooting in U.S. history. At the same time, Harvey Weinstein, Hollywood mogul, exposed as a sexual predator, the entertainment industry is turned inside out by Me Too. Then on the other side of the world, in Myanmar, our hopes for a transition to democracy under a Nobel Peace Prize winner were smashed by the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya, part of a much larger refugee crisis that we can't even agree on, much less fix. In the UK, on that note, Brexit, the EU in chaos. Back home, again, Stoneman Douglas High School more recently, 17 high school students killed with a gun that a teenager can buy over the counter. And to top it all off, you have world leaders now threatening nuclear war on Twitter. Is it just me, or does it feel like the world is falling apart at the seams? And it's not just the classic, why do bad things happen to good people? It's deeper than that. It's like, I feel like, so many of the people and places that we put our hope for the future in have been dashed on the rocks. If you, like me, grew up at all in and around the 80s and 90s, um, we grew up in an unprecedented time of peace and prosperity, at least all across the Western world. You had Clinton, you had an economic boom, you had Baywatch, like remember back in the day, an emblem of a gener... Like, not the new one, like the original, not... I was homeschooled, I had nothing to do with that, but, um, <laughs> you know... And all of that was parallel to an unprecedented time of secularization, the, the overall death or at least decline of faith and religion in the U.S. And a lot of us bought this PR campaign waged by everyone from progressive professors in academia to marketing gurus in L.A. or New York that we could create our own little utopia without God. That religion, if anything, was part of the problem, not part of the solution, part of the past, not part of the future. We don't need that anymore. We have been set free to create our own utopia, but that lie has been exposed. We put our hope in science to arrest global warming. We put our hope in the school system to end the cycle of poverty. We put our hope in psychology to end all of the chaos and neuroticism in our mind. We put our hope in Washington, D.C. to pull us all together. We put our hope in Hollywood to make us all happy. We put our hope in Silicon Valley for pretty much everything. Instead, it was let down after let down. I think this image does such a great job of capturing our cultural moment. Mark Zuckerberg, the poor guy on the front cover of Wired, beat up black eye, cut lip, the social network that was supposed to bring all of us together, at least those of us over 35, instead used by Russia to tear America apart. Yet one more failed attempt at utopia. Well, at least we still have Instagram until it goes out of business. And then it's dystopia. <laughs> Decades ago, the theologian and philosopher Leslie Newbegin said that secularism will eventually expose itself as the untrue story that it is. And when he said that, everybody thought, this was back in the 80s, everybody thought he was out of his mind. Like, you're clearly not watching Baywatch, Nubigen. But he said eventually it will expose itself, and all that we will be left to put our hope in is Christ himself. He said not even the church will escape our cynicism and letdown and disappointment. We'll be left with nothing and no one to hope in but Christ. Here we are decades later, and his words feel more prophetic than ever before. By the way, welcome to church. We're so happy you're here. Just here to, you know, encourage you. So you're like, what is this, like, photojournalism from hell? Is this like an April Fool's thing? Is there a joke coming? No joke. Church is the place that we come not only to celebrate that Jesus is alive, but also to process the pain of life this side of resurrection. And if we're all honest, it has been a rough year. And yet, 
On the other hand, in spite of the fact that I just read this study a few days ago that asked Americans, do you believe the world's getting worse, better, not changing, or the same? And 71% of Americans said worse. In spite of that, depending on your metric system, the world has never been better. Johann Norberg, in his book Progress, which made waves just a few years ago, measured 10 areas, food, sanitation, life expectancy, poverty, violence, the environment, literacy, freedom, and equality, and made the point that by every single metric, we are at an all-time high. Did you know that in the last two decades, we have cut global poverty in half? Just a century and a half ago, most Americans and Western Europeans were living in far worse conditions than most people are today in Sub-Saharan Africa, on the equivalent of less than a dollar a day. Quote, despite what we hear on the news and from many authorities, the great story of our era is that we are witnessing the greatest improvement in global living standards ever to take place. Poverty, malnutrition, illiteracy, child labor, infant mortality are falling faster than in any other time in human history. Life expectancy at birth has increased more than twice as much in the last century as it did in the previous 200,000 years. The risk that any individual will be exposed to war, die in a natural disaster, or be subjected to a dictatorship has become smaller than in any other epoch. War, crime, disaster, and poverty are painfully real, but they are rapidly declining. What we see now are the exceptions where once they would have been the rule. Now, Norberg's ideas, or really it's just research, have been popularized by Steven Pinker, whose best-selling book, Enlightenment Now, is literally on the, you know, the end of every other end shelf at Powell's. It's very popular in our city. The basic idea is, wake up, everybody. We are living in the golden age of human history. Pinker's famous, and the critique of him from a number of sources is that he's rewriting history to make the Enlightenment the hero of the West, not the Protestant Reformation. But even if he's right on that note, What Pinker and Norberg and friends have to admit is that even though by that set of metrics we are in the golden age, the hard truth is that very few of us feel that way. In fact, since the 1960s, happiness has been on the decline in the U.S. Mental illness is through the roof. Psychologists are using the word um, epidemic for anxiety, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, all sorts of other shades of that. Antidepressants have become a multi-billion dollar industry. The best-selling prescription drug in the U.S. is an antipsychotic with sales over seven billion in 2015. The family is breaking down. Divorce is at an all-time high. Now, Pinker and Norberg both argue that the problem is the news media. Because we see the world now through what Norberg calls the distorted filter that is our smartphone, which curates a hand-picked selection of all the worst things that have happened over the last 24 hours, right? That's the problem. And so we think that the world is getting worse when really the world, if you look at the data, is getting nothing but better. And there's no doubt that's true, and we can't blame the news media. Like, that's not the, it is, it's capitalistic. It's a for-profit industry. You get what you pay for. It is the human condition. We all know this. We gravitate toward bad news. News. If it came out this week that one of the Bridgetown staff members was an international arms dealer, right? Gavin down here, like secret <laughs> RP- RPG cash in his garage in Southeast or whatever. If that came out, you would all know about it within 10 minutes. Text message, Facebook, Instagram story. It would be all over the city, front page of the New York Times the next morning. But when somebody's life, somebody comes to faith in Jesus through Alpha and somebody's life is transformed, and the story I was just hearing about a few days ago where there's a a couple that divorced and then is now getting back together through apprenticeship to Jesus, when a marriage is healed, when a mind is healed, when a body is healed, we have to stand up here on stage and tell that story. I do these things, um, not a lot, but don't think more of this than there is, but I call them Jesus experiments once in a while where I just play around with a habit or a little turn of thought to index my heart toward the kingdom. And so in my morning routine, normally I read the news for 30 minutes, start with the times, and then read the right, and then local. And that's kind of my morning routine. It's a great way to just start depressed. And um, (laughs) so I thought, okay, what if just for, and I know some of you think this is scandalous, but what if just for one week, as a thought experiment leading up to Easter and my, you know, teaching on bad news, um, what if I just don't read the news for a week? And instead, um, in that little half-hour time block, I just spend a few minutes 
uh, just drinking a good cup of coffee and thinking about things I love in the world, in our city, in springtime, and just practice gratitude. So I did that. Last thing I heard, um, Stormy Daniels was about to go on 60 Minutes. I don't even know what happened. I have no idea. Good, bad. I have no clue if we still have a president. I have no idea. I don't even know, but I'll go on Twitter tomorrow and get everything, okay, from an accurate source. Um, So guess what? I did that for an entire week, and guess what? It gave me a whole new outlook on my life and our beautiful city this time of year, and I was happier. But did it solve all of my problems? No, did it solve all of my issues? Of course not, because we all know that's true for sure, but our, this goes deeper than our penchant for clickbaity bad news. Andrew Sullivan, in a scathing critique of Pinker, his recent book, in the New York Times Magazine had this to say, as we have slowly and surely attained more progress, we have lost something that undergirds all of it, meaning, cohesion, and a different, deeper kind of happiness than the satiation of our earthly needs. We've forgotten the human flourishing that comes from a common idea of virtue. For most of the ancients, freedom was freedom from our natural desires and material needs. It rested on a mastery of these deep, natural urges in favor of self-control, restraint, and education into virtue. They'd look at our freedom and see licentiousness, chaos, and slavery to desire. They'd predict misery, not happiness, to be the result. And they would be right. The modern world, for all that is good about it, the science, the technology, the lifespan, the mortality rate, the luxury that we all, now like every condo that goes up is a luxury condo. Is there a non-luxury condo anymore? <laughs> Everything's luxury, right? Have you, has anybody had, it just started a few weeks ago, the honey cardamom latte from Heart with house-made cashew walnut milk? Have you had that? There's like a war going on in Portland, so you know, um, Cova just opened a few blocks down the street. It's like the first real competition to Heart on the west side of the river. And they started with this new honey latte that's all the rage. So then Heart then had to come back out with a honey cardamom latte. How do you top that? It's the best $13 you will ever spend <laughs> in your entire life. And if you don't believe in God, just drink that. And then tell me you're an atheist. It's impossible, right? But as great as the honey cardamom latte is, especially with the house walnut cashew milk, still, it has no meaning. As Viktor Frankl pointed out, as human beings, we crave meaning. Our brains, evolutionary psychologists, are what, the reason so many of them are coming back to faith right now is because discovery of the brain is, is making what we have said for thousands of years true. The human brain is hardwired to search for meaning and purpose in life to search for a meta story to insert our micro story into. Frankl's famous line was, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. He said that after concentration camp under Nazi Germany. Yet our society no longer has a why other than maximize pleasure and minimize pain. And when it comes to pleasure, we're killing it, at least if you make enough money to live it. Ah, we're doing great. But it still comes up empty. Positive psychologists have now pointed out there are five levels of happiness. Level one is material needs, and that's beautiful. Money, food, you know, drink, eat, all of that, a roof over your head, but that's the base level of happiness. After that is meaning, after that is community, and the highest level of happiness is what they call transcendence, or what we would call life in Jesus. So, my point is, we live at a cultural moment where there are two narratives about the world at the same time. One says it's all going to hell in a handbasket. So you just pack up, it's only a matter of time until like it's Hunger Games all over again, right? The other says, it's never been better. Welcome to Utopia, have a honey cardamom latte. Both have data to back up their point. Study after study, both feel kind of true, yet at the same time, not all the way true. It's almost, I feel like, we are progressing materially and technologically, but regressing psychologically and relationally and spiritually. This sense that, yeah, grandma and grandpa didn't have a car sharing app or third wave coffee or a luxury condo, but they had something else. 
My point is we live in the tension between two narratives about the future of the world. Enter Paul. Now we're ready for Romans. Listen to Paul put language to that tension that is not a 2018 thing. It is a human thing. Chapter 8, verse 18. Read with me. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole cosmos has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen, it's no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Okay, before we make sense of Romans 8, a little bit of backstory for those of you that are new to the Testament. Before Paul became a follower of Jesus, he was a Jewish rabbi. And like most rabbis in the first century, he would have divided human history into two ages, this present age and the age to come. This present age, and this is of course language out of their world, not out of ours, was the entire story of humanity from Genesis 3, if you've read the Bible, until now. It was life post-Garden of Eden. It was marked by evil, human evil, oppression, injustice, racism, sexism, abuse, all of that scandal, natural evil, a Hurricane Harvey, global warming, famine, natural disaster, and even more than that, spiritual evil. They believe that behind so much of the evil and even even people of the world was a personified evil that was spiritual or immaterial, but yet it was just as real as the human or the material. The age to come, on the other hand, was a time in the future marked by the exact opposite, by peace and prosperity, (laughs) no more evil at all, when human history would reach its glorious climax under the rule and reign of God, what the Hebrews called the kingdom of God. And the seam between this age and the age to come was in Hebrew, Yom Yahweh, or the day of the Lord. We would say judgment day, but we think of that phrase as a pejorative, as a negative thing. For an ancient Hebrew, though, judgment day was a good thing. If you're poor and you are oppressed, you want the judgment of God, right? You want freedom from all of that poverty and oppression. You want judgment. Even if there's violence with it, you crave God to step into human history, to put the world to rights, to eradicate and stomp out and end evil, and even if that means evil people, and to usher in a new reality of peace and equality and justice. And so this was the framework. This present age and the age to come with this seam, this transition point in between of the day of the Lord. Now, the resurrection of Jesus on the first ever Easter messed all of that neat, tidy theology up. The rabbis were expecting the resurrection of all humanity at the end of history. Instead, what we got was the resurrection of one man right in the middle of history. This was a twist in the plot. That's what J.R. Tolkien of the Lord of the Rings, what he called a eucatastrophe. Have you heard that phrase before? It's a Tolkien original. It's a literary device that he used. You know the word catastrophe. You is a Greek word. It's a prefix that means good. So a eucatastrophe is like a good catastrophe. He defined it as, quote, a sudden happy turn in a story that pierces you with a joy that brings tears. So in Lord of the Rings, it's when Gandalf, you know that scene, he appears, you think he's dead, but all, they're about to die, it's about to all end, like halfway through, is that movie two? I can't even remember. And then Gandalf appears back from the dead to save the day. That's a you catastrophe. And Tolkien, in an interview, who was a follower of Jesus, said that Easter was the greatest of all you catastrophes. And Paul is the first Jewish rabbi, or one of the first, to work out the implications of this particular eucatastrophe. 
And he, and not just him, along with the other writers of the New Testament, interprets Easter to mean that Jesus has opened up a portal to the future. And in doing so, he has dragged the age to come, the future into the present, the age to come into this present age, put another way, heaven into earth. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright puts it like this, the resurrection of Jesus declared that Jesus was not the ordinary sort of political king, a rebel leader that some had supposed. He was the leader of a far larger, far more radical revolution than anyone had ever supposed. He was inaugurating a whole new world, a new creation, a new way of being human. He was forging a way into a new cosmos, a new era, a form of existence hinted at all along but never before unveiled. Here it is, he was saying. This is the new creation you've been waiting for. It's open for business. Come and join in. This is what Paul is getting at when he says things like this in his letter to the Corinthians. This world in its present form is passing away. A lot of people misread here, Paul, including Christian fundamentalists, to think that, you know, planet Earth is doomed, it's all going to hell. Nothing could be further from Paul's point. By this world, he doesn't mean planet Earth. Notice that phrase, in its present form. In Greek, it's one word, schema, where we get the word schematic. It means the world as it is set up now, with all of its systems of oppression and injustice and an evil. This isn't about the end of the world, but the end of a world, and the beginning of a new one. And for Paul, we live in a time of overlap between these two worlds or these two ages, the age to come, the present age, what one scholar by the name of Ladd called the time between the times. In Paul's mind, there think about this for a minute, there is a world that right now as we speak is dying off. It's going away. And there is another world that right now as we speak is being born, it is coming to pass. Hence the word picture at the center of Romans 8, right open in front of you, of birth pangs. On that note, now we're ready to work through Romans 8. Paul in this story, and all through the New Testament, tells a third story. Beyond the option A, it's all going to hell. Option B, it's all better than it's ever been, have a latte. Paul tells a third story about the nature of reality. Notice three things about this third story from the passage open in front of you. First off, for Paul, life is full of suffering, frustration, and groaning. All language right out of the passage. 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. 20, the creation was subjected to frustration 22, we know the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, 23, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. Paul's metaphor for the felt experience of life in the time between the times is that of a woman in labor groaning for the pain to end and the baby to come out. Mothers, are you with me? I'm surprised I did not get more than that. All right. (laughs) But that's how we all feel. When will this pain end? When will the school shootings end? When will the acrimony in the political sphere end? When will the gap between rich and poor, between this color and that color end? When will the racial divide heal? When will utopia come? We groan with the ache of unfulfilled desire. No matter how good our life is, as Carl Rayner so famously said, in this life, all of our symphonies remain unfinished. What he meant was no matter how much money you make or how many lattes you drink or how good you have it or healthy your body is or your marriage is, your family, no matter how good or high up the socioeconomic ladder you are, there's always this sense of an unfinished symphony. It's like almost but not quite, not there, not enough. There's an ache, there's an incohate longing for a better life and a better world. Maybe you're here this evening and you're groaning and you feel it, an acute or a dull ache underneath the distraction of your busy life or, or far more than that, an acute pain over your marriage, over a child, over your career, over the death of a dream, over a failure or a disappointment, over whatever happened in the news that I missed this last week. 
you're here and you're groaning. Yes, welcome to the human condition. This is the one thing that the West just cannot figure out how to handle, and that is suffering. We thought we, we could create a utopia with no suffering. And while we can mitigate so much of the suffering of the world, at least at a material level through science and medicine and technology and wealth, we cannot stomp it out because to be human is to bleed and in the end to die. And ironically, when you expect life to be easier, it's so much harder than it has to be. And when you expect life to be hard, as Paul, who's not a pessimist, right, but he's brutally honest about the human condition, actually life is far more of a gift. You receive every sunny day, every gift of grace, every hug, every smile, every meal as gift to be enjoyed, not as a right, but as icing on the cake. But if you're here and you are groaning for a better life and a better world, you are not alone. Paul is open about that. Secondly, for Paul, and forgive me, I'm sick down right now. I apologize. Hopefully we'll make it to the end. For Paul, the main problem in the world isn't the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or this president or that or immigration reform or refugee reform or poverty or the education system or whatever. The main problem is the human condition. If Paul were here, he would say all of those other things. Those are problems, but those are the symptoms, the root issue, the disease, if you prefer, is the human condition, what we call the human heart, what Paul would call our flesh this primal animal-like part of us that is a desire we can't or don't control, that we are enslaved by, where we have to do this thing that we don't want to do, but we kind of want to do because it's not right for us, for our mind, for our body, for our relationships, for our city, for the environment itself. The humanistic anthropology that so many of us grew up on, that we're all beautiful little snowflakes who are corrupted by big bad society, and the problem is external, not internal. It's out there, not in here. If we can just get the right candidate, the right legislation, the right technology, the right killer app, the right business set in place, then we can fix all that is wrong. And while I love that heart to make the world better, that anthropology just isn't working. It's losing not only to theologians like Paul, but to evolutionary psychologists like Jordan Peterson who writes, quote, if society is corrupt but not the individuals within it, then where did the corruption originate and how is it propagated? Rhetorical question. The data is in. There is no question now. Science is finally backing up what writers like Paul have been saying for millennia, that something is off, not outside of us, but inside of us. And all of these other symptoms are a part of a much deeper problem. As the saying goes, we have met the enemy and he is us. That saying, by the way, was made popular by the first, I read this a few days ago, the first ever poster for Earth Day in 1970. <laughs> I think that's really funny. Yeah, a few of us do. We're not the only sadists in the room. <laughs> I love 20, Paul writes, for the creation was subjected to, <coughs> to frustration. Oh my gosh. Mm. Uh, was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation will be liberated from its bondage. Meaning we're not the only ones who are frustrated. Creation itself is to the animal kingdom, Mount Hood, the Pacific Ocean, is frustrated, it's suffering, it's groaning, just like we are under the weight of corrupt human beings. The reality is, so many of us want to save the world, and there's not, that's not all bad, but we need to be saved. <laughs> and Paul, that's the beginning point, for the healing of the world is the healing of the human condition. For the transformation of the world or of society or of the school system or of government is the transformation of the human heart. We need to be saved by something or someone outside of ourselves, and it's not a killer app. It's not a technology, it's not a law, it's not a business. It is Jesus of Nazareth. He is the great hope of the world. And that is Paul's third idea. For Paul, number three, the main hope for the world and the human condition is resurrection. That of Jesus and of his followers. 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. 
Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan <coughs> inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. That line, the redemption of our bodies, is a nod to resurrection. That's code language. That's insider language for resurrection. Notice, not Jesus' resurrection. Whose resurrection? Our resurrection. Keep in mind, make sure you get your head around this. A lot of American Christians get this one a little bit wonky. A lot of people think of the future as a two-step process, life followed by life after death in heaven or hell, depending on what you believe. Actually, what you believe has no bearing on what's true, but that's a separate teaching. But in the scriptures, it is a three-step process, life followed by life after death, followed by what N.T. Wright calls life after life after death, or resurrection. And the idea is very simple. What happened to Jesus one day in the future will happen to all of Jesus' followers. We, like him, will die. We, like him, will go into the ground or to the wind or whatever it is. And then we will be raised from the dead by the power and the authority of the creator over all the creation, the God who spoke the universe into existence. The metaphor used by Paul, both here in verse 23 and Corinthians, all through the New Testament, for Jesus' resurrection is that of first fruits. It's an agrarian metaphor. There's one farmer in the house tonight. Other than that, most of us miss it, but we get spring, right? We look forward to it all year long, and then it's such a letdown. But we, um, it's just more mud and rain, but you don't get to wear a scarf. It's like, come on. Um, but it's very similar to the idea of spring. Those bright <coughs> buds on the trees outside, that green or, or the beautiful pink growth is a sign of what's to come, that summer is coming, that a picnic is coming, that a bike ride to work where I'm not sopping wet and my hands don't ache with pain from the cold. That is coming growth and fruit and life is coming, I believe it, in faith. <laughs> but read carefully. For Paul, that future has already started with the coming of the Spirit. Just like summer or the new season has already started. Was anybody around yesterday afternoon? Holy cow, it feels like an eternity ago, but I was outside yesterday. I put on sunscreen yesterday afternoon, and I sat on my front porch with sunglasses, and I read a novel on my Sabbath in the sun. It was glorious. And then I woke up this morning. But <laughs> it's already started. Summer has already started. It's been inaugurated. It's been set into motion and if Paul were here today, he would have words with the secularists. He would say the Enlightenment wasn't the turning point of history. Not even the Protestant Reformation wasn't. The resurrection of Jesus was. There is a reason that we measure time from before and after Jesus. His life, his teaching, his example, his way to be human, his miracles, his kingdom work, his stand for justice and truth and righteousness, his arrest by the religious authorities, his execution under the Roman Empire, three days later, his resurrection from the dead by the Father, his ascension to the right hand of the Father, the pouring out of his spirit, that, set, that inaugurated a whole new world right in the middle of this one. It set into motion the death of one world and the birth of another. And Paul, listen carefully, for Paul, we groan. Yes, life is hard. There's frustration. There's unfinished symphonies. We groan. But it is the groaning of a woman in labor. And you can only be pregnant for so long. We groan not in grief over the past, but in hope for the future. For Jesus to come back and finish what he started in Easter. That's why on Easter we look back, but we also look forward. And we celebrate, but we also groan, living in this moment where one world is dying and another is coming to birth. And we put our hope, we put the weight of our life, we set the aim of our future on the return of Jesus to make all things new. So to end, we come to the waters of baptism. This is the way that you join the story of Jesus, that you make your micro story or mine about the macro story of the healing and the renewal, not only of humanity, but of the cosmos itself. Notice that Paul's vision here of the future isn't just you doing better. 
It's the whole cosmos set free from groaning. And this rhythm, this ritual of baptism is a symbol. It's actually more than a symbol. We believe something happens in the moment. But it is a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. Death, you go under the water. Symbol, not literal. Don't freak out. Um, But you go under the water as a symbolic way of dying to your old pattern of life that matched the old world that is dying away. Burial, you wait, you trust all that you are into the love of God. Resurrection, you come back up out of the water to a new way of life based on the example and the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth and a new community, a family to your right and to your left with a new spirit in the marrow of your bones to match a whole new world. Death, burial, resurrection, and baptism. We identify with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We put our hope in that. We say yes to that narrative arc for our own story. And water itself is a symbol, an evocative one at that, of the Holy Spirit. And if you're new to that language, what we mean by the Holy Spirit is the person and the power and the presence of God. In baptism, you are immersed, like full on, we don't sprinkle, we dunk, right? All the way in, all the way under, we are immersed in the person and the power and the presence of God. And he becomes the new air that we breathe, the new reality that we inhabit. Portland becomes our secondary home and the reality of God, our true north. Jesus called this the life that is truly life. Jesus talked a lot about eternal life in the Gospel of John, but a number of scholars have said, actually, that's not a great translation of the Greek because the language there has to do with this idea of the age to come, Jewish language. And a lot of scholars have made the point, a better translation is the life of the age to come. Because for Jesus, this life wasn't just about quantity, but about quality. It wasn't just about the future, what happens after you die or after you... What, way down, but about the here and the now. There is life for you here and now of Jesus of Nazareth, and all of you are invited. Let's stand together and pray.